And we're live. Welcome, everyone. It's been a uh, a wonderful stay inside inside your home day today, and uh, you know, boil up a bit of soup and stew or whatever you have to keep you uh, warm. And because uh, it's been raining all day, storms. I've been watching the trees outside. I've been like, you know, really going for it. And um, being on, on a second, um, well, first floor as such, open to the wind, you can see all the rain coming through. And I'm sure most of you guys and here in New Zealand, I mean, here in Northland and in Whangarei have felt it. But of, of course, thank you for watching from around the world. Uh, I get your uh, comments, I get your likes and, and um, you know, shares, and I get you um, coming in and um, seeing what we're doing here and trying to um, continue talking and discussing and, you know, keeping um, discussion alive because that's what it's about. You don't have to, uh, I was saying something earlier on um, that whenever people stop talking, that's when, uh, problems start happening because that's when when dialogue stops that's when people go to the corners and they come up with ideas and how to take care of the other whoever the other may be so once again i am grateful and always um thankful for um my friend jared to join me the captain and um and i'm getting called and i'm gonna have to hang out on my mum <laughs> but I will. so which you don't want to do. They but, could cause a riot. Be careful. Yeah, it's for, her 40 years today in New Zealand, which basically began that began our anniversary of 40 years in New Zealand through her, um, our life here and enjoying our new country. And also our own, my own siblings were actually born here, who were actually Kiwis. And actually uh, other siblings who were actually born here as well, who are part of our wider family and those that are uh, another one that was born in Fiji. So it's it's just the world we live in. We have extended families beyond extended families beyond extended families. And the thing is, family. And I think a lot of people forget that in times of trouble. That you know, uh, you know, it's 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 talking that will stop any conflict as much as it can. But there will always be people out there who will be trying to uh, rattle e either side to get things to happen for them for their own self like i know myself like um there is little bits of things in me that will want to go hmm what if i do this i'll be able to get something for myself out of this more than something for somebody else and i and i think of that and i go well that's like everybody else and what's that like in a crowd what's that like in a bigger family what's that like in a bigger country and a nation one of the things um that happened I mean, we will talk to you about the elephant in the room a little bit later. But what, the one thing I think we should look at is the topic of the night, which is this new pay packet that um, that Labour and Arden, uh, just under Arden, the PMs put out for um, with the finance minister with social welfare uh, at four hundred and ninety nine dollars for unemployed due to coronavirus. Now, the reason I talk, I want to put bring this up tonight is that. Um, one of my friends who lives all the way down in Chicago had to work through the whole CV period, uh, do the night runs, uh, night shifts, and all that because of the work because he's worked in a plant that produces food, and of course we can't go without food. And so these people, just like the medical professions and all those other people, had to work while we were locked down, and while other people that were locked down as well, uh, but they had to work. And they had to work. They, you know, they couldn't go, well, sorry, I might get sick if I come in. They're like, no, no, put on your mask and get out of work. Now, they get amount the same amount that these people are going to be getting who have become unemployed. So the question was, um, if you're getting tax-free $500 basically in your pocket, that is going to create a second uh, layer of unemployed privileged people compared to the normal rate that you get which is around about 270 or something depending on what else you can get uh depending on what your needs are uh and of course um you know there's a dpb there's an balance there's a sickness benefit and so on uh but 500 dollars for maybe a job that you were only getting 300 dollars for at one time or 400 dollars for uh that you could take home after tax um there's the other thing about where there's a double tax where you do if you're doing two part-time jobs you get hit with a double tax. I used to get that. Uh, you know, I got that hit, hit with that for about two years uh, because I was trying to make sure I had, you know, money when I left the city that I was living in. 
so that I could have a better setup when I went somewhere else. Um, so you worked hard for that. But the other thing that um, one of my other friends raised up here, which is a different thing, because they're both of the same ethnicity. So there's one up here in Northland and one down in Southland. And both of them said, I'm working hard and I'm not able to get that amount. Yet someone else who's because of the situation um, are able to get more than me to take home. And that's kind of sort of is going to create a situation where that's always been here, mind you, because I remember when I was a student, I'd be going, well, how come all these people who are unemployed able to work? And these are, I'm talking about really, really healthy fit people who are able to work. I can see them lounging around and I've lived with people like that as well. Um, so, and I've been in a situation when I've been unemployed as well, where I've had to rely on um, the benefit for that. Where I'm at, I'm doing my three years and I'm thinking, I'm getting less than these guys for doing absolutely nothing, yet I'm still going to have to pay this loan back. And yet these guys don't have to worry about a cent they're getting to pay back. And that that creates a bit of animosity. Uh, and Sam, the other thing is then you have people who actually are employed looked at the welfare system and go, these guys have been there for years. Then you got that animosity. But now you're compounding the problem now with actually giving somebody $200 more than the already unemployed or new, new unemployed. I remember we were talking about this, about 30,000 people were going to be on, our, on the system. But the other side of this is, what about the workers who are still working? Are they going to look at the tax pay and go, we're going to, our taxes are going to go up to pay for this. And that's where it comes into your area, um, Jared, um, Cap, and because you know more about finances than I do. But these are sort of things that um, I, I kind of think about when I'm sitting around, and, and especially when I look at my Facebook and I see what the feeds are saying, and I go, let's talk about this. You know, how do we, how, you know, if I'm talk, if somebody's asking me the question, I should ask the question as well in, a, in this setting where, people, where we can have dialogue over it. Yeah, I think, you know, we need to think more about, you know, when all of these kind of different sort of contradictions seem to kind of pop up and these things where some people seem to be really, you know, for one thing, but then, you know, another group of people, are, you know, really want to go in a different direction. Mm. And it really, yeah, asks the question, you know, like what what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? And, and one thing that we have kind of pretty much realised is that in New Zealand is that collectively as a community or perhaps, you know, isolated bits and pieces of communities, but overall, you know, we've managed to, to kind of do okay. Um, and that's great. That's fantastic. Um, and so now in other countries, we're saying that maybe it's not so great for them. So then it becomes this almost um, interesting situation of like, well, isn't it fantastic that, you know, us small countries have, have you know, in many ways done so well, and yet these larger nations which, you know, we um, recognise exist and have got power in, you know, the international community. So you've got Russia and the United States and China and, um, you know, um, and India is, and, and many other nations are big players in this world stage. And, uh, you know, here these small nations and also some, also some other large nations have actually done, you know, kind of quite well out of this. And, um, and now we're presented now with new different challenges, which are things about, well, how do you pay for your electricity bill? And, um, you know, you need to do more things online now, but, like, you couldn't afford to have the internet, and so now you're feeling obligated to add an expense to your daily life, which maybe wasn't yeah. something that, you know, was part of your budget. And so everyone starts to have to make these, like, trade-offs which are really challenging you know like do you put 
food on the table for your kids or do you give them a good internet connection? Mm. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, it's not so in the distant future that people that did this sort of thing, like people did this around education, like, you know, and particularly lots of um, migrant families um, often put a lot of attention into education and that collectively and as a community they would invest for someone in there that you know one of the kids in the community to go to university or something because they not because I th thought think that they ever thought that it was like it was you know a, a golden solution or or you know the answer to the problem it was just creating little little glimmers of hope as you try and work out like what's the better solution right so like i actually am one of these people that don't agree with um thinking that you have to um go into all of the academic circles or all of the government circles or all of the gov council yeah. circles in order to infiltrate it um but you know that is definitely a way of of addressing problems is that you know if we can get as many you know different people talking about the problems of people in lots of different places then you know maybe you know when the call is heard that we need to think differently about income and what money is and what assets are um, but it's, you know, it's a really difficult conversation. Uh, and um, I think it, it actually um, will be interesting to see if it might actually become a political issue, not because I would like it to become a political issue, but um, I think that we should actually um, understand, you know, which of, you know, the various parts of, of New Zealand what they're thinking about income and supporting people and and it would be really great to see like a really like beautiful New Zealand view of like what people really think that's not politicized but just yeah. kind of like you know like what do we all think about making sure that everyone's got like all the kind of basic stuff you know right and, and, you, and you're right there about the internet stuff because, uh, and um, but before I go into that, you mentioned about, um, you know, certain um, um, groups that uh, families, they put the one person, uh, one child first to do that. But we, um, like, uh, coming from being an Indian and stuff, uh, Indians do that as well. It's, it's really, like, I mean, it's one of the main key points is that you put all your money into the education of your children and make sure that the next thing is that you have food on the table, that they have lunch to make sure that they there's food for the lunch. And I remember my grand, um, granddad doing this for our family, seven kids. Um, I used to, uh, At the time that I was going to school, um, I was the um, youngest uh, grandchild, the first, firstborn grandson, right? Uh, which, you know, you're pampered, uh, being the male grandchild. Uh, but like, so, but we had three, I think it was, yeah, three uncles between me and like, I guess about 65, somewhere along that, about 15 years, may even be 55, something like that between us. There was three of us. I was at primary and the other three were at secondary school, which basically would be high school here uh, now or college. And they had to have the dress really well every morning. They had to make sure that they looked perfect, that they had the uniforms, they were there. And, um, and education was like the number one thing in our family. And um, so you'd see a lot of scholars, uh, scholarship students coming out of Fiji, going to Australia. You know, you would have seen that uh, where uh, Australian University used to offer uh, scholarships to Fiji um, and, um, and also New Zealand would offer um, scholarships to um, poor families from Fiji who are really, uh, you know, children from villages who are very highly educated. And so the parents and the grandparents at home will be going work hard Earn, you know, get there and you'll be able to go travel overseas and you'll be able to do better for yourself, whatever you want to run it, make sure you get to that university level. You cannot drop out was the thing. You you couldn't drop out. And so, you know, you couldn't say, well, I've done fifth form now, I can leave now. There was no such thing as school leaving unless the other thing was you're going to work on the farm if you do. That was it. You want to work on the farm, boy? 
you know, and because we're farmers, you know, and that was that attitude. And I think uh, because Fiji being an agrarian, uh, agricultural society, um, you know, and farming community is as large as that is, you'd have, um, you know, it was it was built in that education was a key thing. Um, but then you also, you know, then you see that, um, you know, a lot of our doctors and nurses have come out and they travel all over the world now. Uh, a lot of, I mean, even my grandparents, um, grand uncles, you know, we've had them living in Australia and Canada, you know, and you think like, how did you get there? And I look at our family history and I go, you were here in the 70s in Australia? What? You studied in, in Christchurch in the 80s? You know, and you kind of look at them and go, how did you get here? Oh, scholarships. You know, we got to travel when we were kids and, um, you know, they would leave. They'll just get on the plane and come over. And but the other thing is then you've got the Asian community as well. They do that. China, um, China does it a lot. They send their children out into the Western society um, to get a, uh, an American, Australian, New Zealand, uh, English education. Um, they put all that money behind that one child um, that they have and um, or that they're allowed to have, I guess. And they spoil that kid and we, we've seen problems off with that we um, and same thing with us like you know every culture when the kids get out of parents uh, under their parents thumb they'll play out and we've seen that in the Indian community we've seen in the Asian community at large but the, the great thing is that I think what we then had to do to uh, facilitate that for um, as as tax paying you know and you know before my time and during my time is that our taxpayers then had to pay into the universities for that to um, to allow the scholarships for the other students to come over. Now, the problem with that is that allowed us to um, basically um, not be able to educate our own and offer scholarships to our own as well, because the scholarships were going to overseas students to try to get them um, better. But in a way, it was investing in the future of that country, which is a good thing. And also, the other thing is that it could also uh, invest in ourselves as well. And you, especially when you look at sports, especially when you look at sports in the islands, we've taken all the best players of Fiji into Australia and New Zealand for league and rugby, and we've kicked everybody else's butts all over the world because of that investment into that into those places, uh, building the stadiums, building, you know, getting out the money into those, um, you know, and, uh, like – uh, support into them and I think that is the other side of that coin where we can go okay we can invest in you now we want our investment back and and the thing is I think our um, what we're going to find and I've mentioned this before is that due to um, the lockdown and the situation with this the travel is going to be lower and I think hopefully our education system will be able to bounce back really strong again and um, and you know um, and education will be um, seen as the really important thing to be able to compete against the world again. Uh, and, you know, we mentioned about before about IT people coming back and staying back and not going because we have a better way to offer people. And and you mentioned this earlier, saying that how we could, uh, in earlier broadcasts, how it's safer here. And it's been proven it's safer here. Within, you know, a couple of weeks, it's, we proved that it was safer here. And you're right on that because, um, you know, and that the fact that uh, we when we were discussing it, it was like we realized there's a, it's a wider community. There's more, um, you know, uh, there's more space. So we're not congested very easily in a very um, tight -knit community. And, um, you know, and we're not sort of, um, you know, pressed into a little ghetto type situation uh, or, um, you know, we're so mixed and we're able to go to the beach. We're able to go, you know, go up the um, go for a hundred K um, um, drive and, it's just open space, you know. It's not just a concrete, concrete, concrete buildings, 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 but and also it's all we have so much resources, and I think that's a great thing about what we have um, in our little walker, um, that we are able to, um, you know, offer so much to ourselves as a country, and to our own, um, and to our folks, uh, and um, and to the generations to come, um, and hopefully that those internet we talked about um, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, so that we can roll out and make sure that every um, home has, you know, has um, provision of having a, um, a laptop that's signed in to be able to, um, you know, log in and something like this happens. Or even if we have a hurricane, you know, we're in a bit of a storm now, 
what if you know power lines went down and we weren't able to communicate uh, but we're able to because uh, we have underground power, power lines or we have underground resources and um, you know because you, you're more up to date on how these digital things work so tell us more you know how you think what the technology is going to be for us um, going forward with this yeah look you know i think we're quickly learning again the difference between what technology offers us as a culture as a collective culture and it's it's and purely it's downsides you know the the aspects of it that aren't um constructive so I think we've learned through these mediums of like this being able to talk of more people live streaming what's happening in their community and 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 being um, having kind of more of that global mindset and and I think you know that's where the technology is I think people are who even weren't used to doing a lot of this stuff before have been amazing at like going and out of their way and like teaching themselves and pushing themselves to engage with this technology to discover that there's a big conversation going on out here. It's a big conversation. We've always talked about how the internet could be a power for good. And so far it's it's not necessarily, you know, really proved to be that. Um, but that I think is to mistake, you know, how things are used, mm. but what the infrastructure is useful for. Uh, and we've found that technology can be great for kids at a time like this. Like it can actually connect, keep them connected to uh, far now and to um, teachers and to, uh, you know, be able to connect with their friends, their cousins. And not only that, but also, you know, we all we're like I think more people are realizing about how their families are very all around the world. So lots of people have, have been talking to perhaps even relatives in other parts of the world that they don't normally talk to because everyone's so busy and everyone's time zones are different, and so you don't. But in this period whereby more people have been kind of at home, then there's been new connections that have been opening up through all of this. Uh, and uh, I think um, I think even you know if even if we take Whangarei locally, I I think that uh, even Whangarei has actually you know found a way to get itself more connected locally because people have been like trying to find certain things. You know, you know people have been like really resourceful and going like, where can I get? you know, this plant or where can I get, you know, this particular vegetable or this m meat or, you know, and so people have been very resourceful and people have been, you know, getting online and they've been, you know, opening this up. So, you know, like it's one, I, you know, like I think we need to be really, really careful about what, what, what we're exposing our community to as we open up the internet but I think we're starting to then suddenly go, well, yes, definitely, you know, all of this technology and the internet can be really useful in how it facilitates human interactions. It, it, it creates this kind of like global marketplace. And, and the reason why I want to bring this back to the original question about, you know, like what, what, like what is a reasonable way for everyday people in Aotearoa to live like who needs what um that's why I think you know we we need to ask this you know deeper national question whilst whilst the rest of the world is in turmoil I think we should be taking this opportunity to be asking this deeper national question of like 
you know, how do we value each other and how do we value the gifts that we bring and 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 also how do we deal with the challenging people in our community where it's maybe not that obvious or clear as to what they bring and how do we work with that um, and how do we bring everyone into doing this because in now our kind of like now little lockdown country uh, um, I, I I think we, you know if we could work out more about how we value each other and what is value and what are what are the things that we value um it's almost kind of like another opportunity to reset you know who we are as this little small country you know because we are just a little small little country a dot on the map uh and yet i think that we've got the heart and mind and intelligence of the rest of the world. Are you still there? Yeah. Oh, for a minute there, you stopped. I was like, I was frozen still. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think the, the best way. I'm just going to have some pizza. The best way to figure out how we value each other is to put politics aside. I think um, it's that what I started out with earlier, saying that when we stop, when we start, uh, when we stop talking, we go into our corners, and that's you know that's a proven thing. And you know uh, we get our backs up, we go, who's on my side? Who's on my side? Now we're going to go in forward. You know, it's a bit like a game, and you know, but um, and we've been playing it for a while. This game of who's on my side, who's on your side, you know, and um. And we've seen it like it's you know it's been national it's been um um labor it's been national it's been labor and then you have the special uh you know uh the mvp from another team who we buy in every now and then and could be uh you know it could be a green party member or you know a green party or it could be a uh a new zealand first or or a um or a um what's the other one there the act party and so on and so on you know and then we just and that's a great thing about multi um you know MMP, multi-member party, is that you get to, um, you know, get to muck it around with it a bit, with, you know, with the two sides. We go, no, 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 sorry, we don't want two sides and only, you know, one side always winning or the other side always winning. We want to make sure that we have a view in there. You know, I, I, it was, I went like that with myself. I went, okay, I'll vote for Labour, but I also vote, vote for a local, uh, I think it was, I'm not sure if it was a national or, or a local uh, Greens member, because I don't want to, you know, I, locally, I want to see locally something else happen. I nationally, I want to see something else happen. And nationally, like I said before, it was about making sure there was housing available to our community um, around New Zealand. Locally, I wanted to see a whole lot of, um, you know, a lot more green incentives happening, cleaner green, because I'm the, I'm, I walk around all the time, so I see how much rubbish is around and how much the waterways are damaged. And I want to see those things clean. So that's how I ch vote, decided to vote on that. And we got a voting coming up soon. And I think what we're realizing is, which brings me to this thing about this, these signs I saw um, that's been posted around New Zealand of Jacinda, and um, which looks like a the sign from um, when Obama came into power. You know, when everybody was trying to vote for the same red, white, and blue colors, the same little. Um, Little um, kind of um, very de designer, designer chic, uh, de very design oriented, um, very pop, pop art looking thing. But one thing I learned after looking a bit more into Obama was that he actually did a bit more damage than people give him credit for to for the black community. And even the black community is saying that actually he harmed the black community. Then he because he was more, you know, after the business side of things and going to war and stuff. And so my always my concern is when people start idolizing leaders, um, you know, talking about how do we value each other in New Zealand, you know, um, when people start idolizing leaders, I don't care who the leader is, we run into the problem, what happens when that leader lets us down? It's like a game. When we start backing the All Blacks forever and ever, what happens when the All Blacks lose? We go in a bit of depression straight afterwards. And um, we noticed that when um, with, uh, with sports, that whenever um, they, everybody goes drinking and afterwards there's a lot of domestic violence happens after a get lost at a game. 
And what happens when Jacinda doesn't win? You know, do we go into this, oh no, the world's gonna look down on us now because she's done so well um, during last year and with the facing with the lockdown and stuff and with the gun control and then with the police um, bill and so on. And now with the great thing about the arts community, you know, putting funding about, I think it was about $78 million into the arts, which I'm very happy for. But the other thing is if you're not into arts, you go, why is she spending all that money in the arts? You know, and why isn't she spending it on such and such and such and such? And so I always try to go, well, these are the questions I, that run through my head. Goes, well, what are the other side thinking? What are those guys thinking when something happens like this? So I go, well, if we start idolizing leadership and we don't um, hold them to account and give them a pass every time um, be because, you know, we don't contest whatever they do or don't challenge them on things because we want to know, well, what's the reason behind what you did that? You know, um, is that really needed and so on? We end up getting to a situation where I think in a in kind of, you know, kind of murky water. Um, I'm trying to be as lenient as I can with that, you know, with the wording in that. It's just we, we can fall into uh, murky water when people don't get what they want, um, you know, and, um, and that's the same thing that uh, will happen on the other side. They go, well, you know, she did this and this and this. But our, our guy's going to win this time. That's sort of, you know, and I worry um, that if the best thing to for us to move forward and value each other is going, well, you know, politics is politics. Let's really, you know, what is our, what does our individual community think? And, you know, we were talking about like um, earlier, you were saying about um, how we're a small com uh, um, country compared to everybody else. When you look at stuff like um, the US, there's like many small countries within itself, which people don't realize how it works. Like Minnesota is a, is a country within itself, within the, because they call them states, they govern themselves, they have the power over themselves and what happens in there, the police have power over themselves, what happens there, um, you know, um, the schools run themselves, how they wanna run it. They can write up their checks, how they wanna do it. Outside government can have the overall region thing, but they still, they do their own thing. and. Um, same thing with New York, same thing with every other thing, because they're basically the size of New Zealand when it comes to each little, you know, little uh, states there. Um, and I think we, we need to make sure that we don't start idolizing um, any leader. I don't care who they are. Just like they, like you have like in America, you have Trump, right? You have, you have people who just bow down to everything he'll say. They'll be like, yeah, he's our man. And then you'll have the Democrat people who go, yeah, it doesn't matter what he's done, what horrible things he's done. Same thing with on the other side. Don't care. He's our guy. When when people get into that situation, even here in New Zealand, I think that's when we go into problems. So we forget our national identity. And people talk about national identity. What is our national identity? Well, we're a very caring community. Uh, we'll, you know, we um, we basically are people who walk everywhere, which means we see everybody. We say hello. We don't keep our, keep to ourselves. We don't hide in our little little places. Uh, we get around. Well, at least I do, you know. But not only that, but we we sort of are able to be very approachable as a as a country. And I think um, the downside of that is that uh, when people um, when we come out of something like lockdown and stuff like this that we stop being approachable. I think if we continue being approachable, if we, you know, go, okay, we haven't seen each other for a while, let's get back into it. Because the other thing is that when you, uh, when you get used to something, I think I said it was, I think I remember uh, seven days it takes you to get used to a habit, or it's a 21 day, something like that. And so if you get used to being stuck in isolation and not talking and seeing people, you kind of, or, you know, you might shy away when you walk down the street, go, that's the, the whole social distancing is like, well, I just want to not be next to you. Don't want to give you a hug now. So it's going to take a bit of, bit of, um, bit of effort to come back out of that shell and start giving each other hugs again and shaking hands, especially that situation. And we've been lucky because, I mean, um, from hearing what you know, hearing from my friends overseas, they're saying we are very lucky because of we've been able to come out of lockdown so fast, uh, have so little deaths. Uh, so little cases compared to other nations and states. 
And mm -hmm. um, because we went into lockdown quite quick, that's that's a plus for us as a country and as um you know as a nation. But also we complied, you know, we complied with what, what was being said. I said, and um, I think we should, you know, we should be able to come back out of this really quickly into full gear. Now, you've been watching a lot of live stream, and you've been talking about how you've been watching, you know. All that. Do you want to tell us um, all this news, you know, things you've been watching and stuff, and um, what what you picked up from around what's going on around the world? Because I kind of center around in certain um, pop culture sort of areas, and especially I'll talk about the later about the riots, but we'll let you carry on. Oh, look, you know, I just value a lot of really diverse perspectives on the same situation. So in this type of situation where, um, and just, just to put this into co like a little bit of context, right? So I don't just spend the time to follow all of these things that happen around the world, but every now and then, you know, there's, there's like a thing that's happening and it makes me kind of go just pay a little bit of attention to what's going on here. So I, I had the opportunity today to uh, access uh, so many different feeds, direct feeds from various US uh, mainstream media organisations. Mm. I... Um, also tapped into the live streams of people that were on the ground in different cities. Um, and it was really interesting to be able to get all of those kind of like diverse sources of what was happening on the ground. And it kind of was a good reminder for me about how you really did you really do need so many different sources to get to stitch the picture together because it and it's like a really beautiful reminder about the challenge of media it's not because any particular media or organization is necessarily evil or has got some conspiracy or they want to you know like you know it's it's quite clear that some media organizations have got an approach they've got an approach for how they present things but you know no one media organization you know has nailed this as far as i can see and actually that's a great thing because uh this is not the time for someone to be nailing to be nailing the narrative mm. i think we're all very aware of the fact that like there's a story being told here. It's a very powerful story. It's a very powerful story because, you know, like, you know, don't you think it's kind of a coincidence that um, and a funny relationship between the fact that within days of the first Americans going back into space, kind of properly under their own control like mm. it's like that's that's like 50 years that this new space program has been developing 50 mm. years and then and then isn't it funny how like and no not funny but deeply sad yeah. that in parallel to this race to space in that same time frame over those 50 years has also been some of the most amazing progresses in um, countries dealing with their history and their origins and their mm. race issues. And there's been so much progress made. And then every time you think that it's like just, you know, going okay, then we get reminded that it's not. And back and forth and back and forth and every other decade has had these, like, major ruptures that are about, you know, like, uh, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's an interesting phrase, you know, Black Lives Matters and, and you know, now has been a really nice reminder around, like, of course all lives matter. But what yeah. this is about is that there are clearly lives of people in our society. And this is what I think coronavirus has been really great at doing is to, like, reminding all of us that we live in a very vulnerable society. And and then, you know, now people are really worried about old people and old people's homes, right? And they've been finding out that apparently these places are like, some of these places are like dreadful. Like, mm. you know, so it's kind of like, it's almost like now that we understand better about how we treat our old people, yeah. and, and, and some of our cultures treat our old people so terribly, it's kind of like reminding people about, like, well, how are we treating everybody else? You know, if we're treating the old people this badly, then, you know, who else are we not treating well? So I think, you know, this highlight on our healthcare system, on older people, on, you know, who do we value? Is it, you know, is it okay for young people to get it and not for old people? Mm -hmm. And all of these other dimensions are reminding all of us of um, that, you know, there's, as, you know, our friends in America are showing us is that, you know, um, I think they're showing us and reminding us of the questions that we all need to be asking ourselves. So that's one bit. And then I think the second bit is that they're giving us an opportunity to ask in advance is that how do we want to work through these questions? Because do we want to do it that way? Because that's yeah. that's just not looking so pretty at the moment. You know, have we got the opportunity to, like, be ahead of the curve? You know, everyone... Everyone talks about like flattening the curve now. Is that like so? Let's bring back you know being ahead of the curve, right? Yeah. So this is New Zealand's opportunity. We've flattened the curve. So now yeah. let's get ahead of the curve. And what's the next curve? That's our problem. I think the next curve of our problem in New Zealand is is that you know we we need to deal with all of the incredible injustices that have happened in the past and the mm. present and will continue to happen in the future and that we need to bring into that this discussion about things like what is a living wage and and how do we value people and and how do we how do we not make you know the artist you know be be made to pick fruit you know like because mm. that's not necessarily a good a good outcome either you know, that we get people to, you know, like, you know, let's find a way in our society to say that the person that feels deeply connected with carving, right, mm. then let them carve, right? And and rather than, rather than, you know, like everyone in society having to kind of like find acceptance, you know, like think of, you know, like imagine if society, if our culture was like this beautiful virus that just took anyone that didn't quite fit in and we just, the whole of our community wrapped around that person and we just found a way to make this work for them as well. And we've talked about this before about mental health mm. because, you know, there's also a lot of mental health that is now a big, a big challenge and I think all of these things are very much connected. Like, you know, if we're talking about a living wage or if we're talking about coronavirus and different government responses and if we're talking about the politics of it and then we're talking about protests, hmm. I think we're all actually talking about the same thing is that there's just a lot of people at the moment that if nothing else, they're just thinking that things just don't feel right. Mm. So let me um, let me move with, um, I think we'll have a quick night tonight, but let me move on with uh, the LA, um, the US riots. This, um, 
the idea that it's a black black thing um and it's only black people being um being hurt or being murdered or being injured by flying blue bullets or uh, you know blue uniforms it's kind of like like a one-sided narrative of the whole idea um because we we know that hispanics um Asian people and also white people, white men or European men have been murdered by the police before. But it's never usually put out there because it's the same thing when it's like when a, um, when a black child goes missing, it doesn't worry the papers. But if a white person, white child goes missing, blue, blonde hair, blue eyes, it's on every sort of paper and it's in every sort of media. And the last six years, um, they've been. What I've noticed is because I had to go back and have a look at how things were happening over in the U.S. Um, that the there have been people who've been like festering and festering this narrative that um, that only one type of life matters and one type of color matters, and so when. Whenever um, one thing about like um, the news, it's always a narrative, and that's why I call my um, you know YouTube channel the narrative, because it's my narrative. When I'm sitting here, it's my narrative, it's my viewpoint, it's my thing. But I open it up because I understand that I, I'm a learner. But it's, I still call it the narrative because I'm a writer, so I know what the narrative of where I'm going with my stories, and that's how I decided to do that. One thing um, a lot of people don't realize is there are actually people that were actually in the city, that have been watching this over the last couple of days, and uh, where there have been outside people from outside the community dropping off pallets of bricks, like pallets of bricks on the way, uh, like just before the right um, protesters are coming. And, they, and there's black men going, where'd these come from? There's no construction here. Where are these from? And I saw a um, broadcast from uh, Minneapolis from a police um, captain. He said, we've, we've already said 40 people and they're not from anyone in our community. And one of the things about um, riots, I've been in a couple that almost blew up, uh, like a couple of hundred kids in the middle of them. And, um, and one of the things I noticed was that if you grab hold of the weak person and pull them aside. The strong will will have to step back and go. I, you know, I'm, I think I'm in the wrong here. And one thing, I, um, there was, you know, it took them four days to arrest this guy, who, you know, who killed this this um, black man. Um, and there were three others there who, you know, were part of it, and they still, I think, um, up till today, hadn't arrested the other three. Yet there was this other thing where there was um, a guy who was defending his um, his store from looters. He was arrested right away, but the police weren't arrested right away. They still four days later took them to arrest, and because it took them four days to do that, it made people angrier. I mean, we here, uh, everybody. I mean, like friends here in New Zealand are going meme, 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 left, right, and center, and um, like there's uh, Facebook groups. They're talking about it here, and I'm thinking. You know, we've just tried to give our police officers here more, more, uh, more, you know, more laws, you know, more new bills to um, come into our homes without any, you know, um, any, um, any sort of the warrants and stuff. And they go, well, that's because they never had to have warrants to come onto your doorstep anyway. Yeah, but you could still say, uh, what are you here for? No, you're not getting in my house. Now you can go in my house. So I'm not going to, I can't stop you. And so... It's weird to people bounce around and uh, I mean, not bounce around, sorry, to say, hey, look at what's happening over there. But then we turn around and go, hey, our officers need more laws. And we go, um, doesn't that seem a bit weird to go, well, if you give this much power to a uniform, don't you think they might take that power a bit further? And this is always my concern is whenever you um, change law, somebody's always going to come and try to change the law a bit further. What else can they do with it? Um, okay, so you're going to say I can have warrantless. 
wait, then I can come and seize a property now. And of course, they did that last year with the guns. They go, well, if we'll buy it back off you. If we don't, I want to seize it off you. All right. But then also they, um, the other side of this thing about looting and all that, I mean, you know, the, people have the right to protest. And there's nothing wrong with it. I've been protesting as well many times, um, even here in Whangarei, you know, um, um, you know, protesters against like a building falling, you know, there was um, at the North Tech Cup in the 90s, which could um, hurt the drama students because it was falling apart and they still had to perform as students in their building. And we'd have a sit and go, no, no, peaceful protests. Nobody was throwing bricks. But the other thing about those things is it's, it harms their own communities, the rioting. It, it's, this is the weird thing about um, the looting and the burning. It's, you've gone from saying, okay, I'm, I'm angry, I'm angry, and not directing at the police stations and the police to directing at the community and going, you know, a lot of black business owners have lost their businesses and communities had their buildings burned down. And, you know, having a look at over this and I'm going, you know, if that happened in Whangarei, how many of our friends would lose their businesses? And how many of them could never build back again? You know, and that sort of thing. So there is there is anger, there's rage, there's grievances, but it's it's been it's been stoked for a couple of years now by the media who's just reported one side of it. And not only that, I've watched white men being um being run through the um, chase through the streets of Portland in daytime with baseball bats and going up to the police station going let me in let me in and the police then going no we're not we're not letting you in it's like what do you mean you're the police no we're not we're not letting you in. but they're ch chasing people for doing absolutely nothing this is daytime Portland you know and you and I'm thinking well so you're the police and this is like just last year right just last year but the other thing of, of this is that these same police officers were giving out tickets and citations as well a couple of weeks ago during the lockdown and um by giving out uh, and basically people were snitching on each other and stuff and getting um you know arrested for d social distancing but nobody's worried about social distancing now nobody nobody over there is worrying about that now because everybody's rioting and stuff um and burning down their own cities. And that's the thing about it. It's like their own cities, the business that they could they'll be working in tomorrow, you know, when they go back. Um, but the other side of that is like, I mean, I've listened to a lot of black men on talk about these things on on you know on on YouTube and I've been following them for about a whole year thinking what what they think about all these race things that are happening in America. And a lot of them they don't they don't have these grievances as they everybody keeps talking about. Um, you know, listening to police officers, listening to people who have actually, uh, you know, musicians and artists, and they basically they talk about how you know you got to take your you got to take the ball by your hands and you got to get out there and create something for yourself and stop blaming this and blaming that and blaming that. I mean, it's been the same thing with me when I started listening to these guys. Are like. I can't blame my pain. I can't blame my injuries. I can't blame this. I can't blame I got to do that anymore. All right. I got to start getting in there and doing it myself. And I watch these guys and thinking, well, then why do so many people believe this out there? Why do so many people believe that this is what's happening? And because there's a part of the um, the, um, the community that's always saying, it's not, it's everybody else's fault but yours. And, um, you know, and it's always everybody else's fault but yours. And I, I remember Nipsey, Nipsey um, Hustle, a, a very famous a black man who was shot by a jealous black man in his own community outside his own business last year. And um, he opened up his store and he was going to, you know, he was, said, you know, did well came back to his community, so I'm going to open up and help my own community. I'm going to employ these people in my own community. And his own community killed him. And there was no riot. His own community killed him. There was no riot, right? A guy from his own community killed him. There was no riot. 
yet there was only around about I think about a, a couple of hundred people that were mourning them and people and actual people um, people online were saying you know as a sad loss to us and within weeks they were over it and and the idea that this is someone who actually worked his way out um, and as a as a rapper from a child from going through all the hustle of all that uh, you know as the name says hustle let's see hustle you know hustled his way to the, to where he was and his own community killed him but but the narrative is it's only the white man kills the black man right and as long as you as long as everybody keep perpetuating that narrative you always will have people blaming somebody else for their problems but the same you know the guys were saying the police officers were saying but every other week in chicago there's a hundred black men killed by hundred by other black men in the community but we don't hear about it all across america right that black people are getting killed by black people black males are dying and nobody talks about these young prominent young black men who are studying their lives hard out going trying to as we're talking about scholarships and stuff going to basketball going to music going to arts getting all these ready to go to scholarships there was one person who was actually killed who was on his way to getting scholarship you know just got on the scholarship and he and they're saying that well it doesn't matter if you're killed by your own community it only matters if somebody else kills you and the thing was the reason i raised that is because i remember in 2014 my um my uncle was stabbed in the neck by a, by a seven-year-old and a 12-year-old who were after some lollies. Our community didn't raise up against the other community and go, you know what? Out of our grief, we're going to burn down our city. You know, We're going to get angry now because you killed one of our prominent people. And I think this is the uh, idea that when we start perpetuating blindly to a belief system that you know, we're not responsible for our own actions and we take on board and that when you're on the street, nobody cares what color you are. Uh, it's us and them when it comes down to it. No, sorry, not what color you are. When, it, when you're on the streets, nobody cares about your politics. You know, nobody cares about your ideals, how much you care about them or how much they care about you. They just see you as them and us. And it's, and it's the weird thing thing because I think um, as much as grief you can have you can you can when you start hurting your own community and um, and your own businesses that's when it sort of kind of goes how far is too far is when I always think about it. it's like how far do I carry this anger you know how far does anybody has a right to carry any anger but we know you know, police have killed people in the past. We've had our injustice here in New Zealand. I mean, even the courts, um, our unjust, you know, in our courts here, um, they've let off people. You know, we had someone who ran down um, a young boy and um, was set free. We had somebody else who was driving a couple, um, two years ago because they were American tourists because their father was very rich. No bail out of here never brought to justice and so we know there's injustices all the time and it, but i think when we start um using i mean not using sorry looking at other places and thinking you know how do we um, negate that to happening here i think w we just need to start um listening to people who actually are actually having the dialogue and questioning things, you know, like we're doing. We're questioning how how does this happen? Why do these people do these things? And I mean, I was angry as soon as I heard it. Oh, another another black man killed another black another white man, <laughs> you know, another white cop, I should say, another cop, you know, and you know because it happens all the time, and it's not because it only happens to black people. It happens to white people, and and um, you know, and the other thing is. A lot of people don't realize that the Asians were getting beaten in the streets during the coronavirus in America. And black people were recording them doing themselves doing that and putting it online, you know, but it wasn't sort of broadcast so much because there was black people doing it. 
and that's the thing about this this whole idea of um, you know because you, racism can't. I mean, I've run into questions where I thought, you know, is this racism? And is this person a person a racist towards me? Is their viewpoint racist towards me? And then you realize, well, it's not actually racist. It's actually he's a bigot, or he's a belligerent person, or he's just an a hole, you know. And I th we, you know, I I think the only reason we we tend to jump to race is because when there's colors involved you know it's it's easier to jump onto race when um an ethnicity whenever it's different from the other and it's us and them so if you like say if, if there was an asian guy uh from japan there oh let's make it let's make it really close let's say there's a sri lankan there uh from ceylon and um and there is a north um, north indian who's a lighter skin it's us and them very quickly you know it's it's and that's because not because they might be worshiping the same god or something or different gods it's because we see the difference straight away and and because we can see the difference straight away it worries me that we haven't come that far if we can be so easily divided within those lines we really haven't in those 50 years we're talking about we really haven't come that far if we still can't see past the differences and and you know i mean i can see myself in the face and i go yeah it's brown but i look at around my room it's like there's nothing in here indian apart from actually that's actually gone as well there's nothing in this house you know this apartment that's actually would anybody walk and go that guy's indian you know and i think that's um it, it's kind of we really haven't come far in those 50 years since that last, um, was it 1960? When, when did we go to the moon last? Mm. Your mic's off. Uh -huh. uh, you were listening to me, so your mic was off. Sorry about that. <laughs> I just realized I was talking for a long time uh, there. Sorry. Oh, no, oh, no it's fine. Um, uh, you know, know, like... Uh, the USA, the USA landed, landed, on the landed on the moon in, in 1969. Um, so... Uh, I I think roughly it was about nine years since the last space shuttle mission, um, so it was a really interesting uh, launch. Um, mm. So it kind of means that uh, the space race is kind of back on, which is really fascinating. You know, in in the midst of all of what's been happening. Um, uh some things have not stopped yeah so um the mission to the um and isn't it interesting in a way like so so here, here's maybe just another perspective about about how we look at everything mm. and, and and we could actually say here's a top down view right yeah so a top down view of of, of where the world's at at the moment is just imagine you're one of the couple of astronauts up in the International Space Station, right? Yeah. Life's great. It's like lockdown. It's just that it's the lockdown that you want to have because mm. you don't really want to go out into the space thing, right? They're not very adapted for the space mm. thing. Anyway, so they're sitting up there in the International Space Station. Lo and behold, global pandemic. Now, mm. can you just imagine, like, and in fact, if you can find this, and maybe you and I, we should remember to do this. We should we should sort of go, like, the, the, this is like the classic big brother moment of, like, people being in the big brother house They've been mm, totally mm, excluded from all other knowledge of the world. And, yeah. and so imagine being the person to say, hey, um, you know how we've got this pandemic, yeah. Mm. You know the people up on the space station? 
like, do you want to, like, just call them? Or, like, I don't know, like, should we just text them? I don't know. Maybe yeah. we should send them an email and just say, hey, whilst you're up there circling the earth, you yeah. know, we just thought we'd we'd let you know, like, we just, we just got a pandemic. Actually, yeah. no, it's not really a pandemic. We've got a global pandemic. And just sort of think, like, for the first time, you've got these people up in space already mm -hmm. in lockdown. Um, and then, and then, like, the only way that they can survive is by, like, humans not turning into zombies and staying yeah. sane enough that, you know, maybe a fraction of our scientists might be able to still do so it's like that classic disaster movie. Like imagine, so you're in the International Space Station, you're going like, are there going to be any humans that will be able to, like, one, remember that we're here, two, mm. remember that, like, as we've learned over the last few days, right, you only get one shot a day yeah. to connect with the space station, right? Um and because uh, um, that's actually still to happen tonight. Um, mm. It'll be the early hours New Zealand time. I think it's going to be around about 2 a.m. New Zealand time that uh, the um, NASA um, launch with SpaceX mm. will dock with the International Space Station. So, and it's been really impressive to watch. Like, just put all the politics aside. It, and even just for a moment, suspend kind of the whole kind of other thing around this. But let's just suspend for a moment is that, like, we've got, at the moment, we've got a whole bunch of humans, so two new humans, that are going to be, like, docking with, like, I think, um, and I want to I wanna fact check this, but I... I might be okay on this, but I actually think the international, the people on the International Space Station at the moment, I don't think they've had any other humans since the global pandemic broke out, mm. right? So, so they're potentially hey, going to be question, meeting... Question, question. What's to say these guys are free from the virus that are going up? What if they're taking it to these guys? Well... Um, that was um, actually one of the things that they talked about that actually really impacted the whole of this mission is that, like, they have been in, like, strict quarantine. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, as a matter of course, so here's kind of, like, just to make sure that it's kind of, like, clear about this. Like, yeah. there's been regular missions all the time up to the International Space Station. Yeah. It's just that it's it's been um, uh, uh, Russia that has been sponsoring those, those launches. But every time ev anyone goes into space, they go into extended quarantine and lockdown for the very reasons of what we're now experiencing. Because they know, like... They know absolute. So here, so here's an interesting kind of way is that it's kind of like, like, what, what, what's the way to take all of this virus stuff seriously? Well, you treat it as if you're doing a space mission, hmm. or even more straightforwardly, it's what they do for for um, like the um, expeditions that they do down to. Um, even New Zealand's own um, Southern Polar uh, yeah. um, project that um, they have to go into strict lockdown because yeah. you you cannot you cannot take any disease down there and and you, you don't want to catch one when you're there so everyone goes into these very strict lockdowns because this is actually a very natural thing um, you know like. So, so in a way, like here's the here's the difference, right? So, like, you can debate whether the virus is as bad or as deadly and blah 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 as everybody else has been talking about. However, here's the thing: what you do do 
is protocol and process. Yeah. And the protocol and process for going to space or going to the South Pole or going on any extended um, mission, really, with anyone, is that everyone has quarantine protocol. Um, that's just how we've been doing it for humans. And I think we've been getting really lax. And then I think now we're starting to confuse um, quarantine protocols and process for just how you normally do with these things. And now people have been confusing that that is for some other purpose. Yeah. But the pro but let's be just really clear that the protocols and the so forth. Now, in these protests now, they've added a, the, this has actually opened up a whole new dimension about, about this because now you've got all these places that are under um, kind of like lockdown from a health measure through a particular piece of, um, like all of these things need to be legal and you can argue the legality and I encourage people to question the legality and then what they should do is that they should then go through the process of launching a court case. So if you feel really passionate about whether something's legal or not, if it's if you think it's illegal, then do the court case mm. and, you know, we'll support you. Um, uh, but you need to do the court case because court cases are very complicated. However, mm. they are very effective, so never dismiss court things. Yeah. Laws, so law. You, I mean, was it Queen's Council? Well, no, no, but the great thing about the law, the great thing about the law, right, is is that th there's three outcomes. You're, you're either right or you're wrong, or maybe the law's not right. Yeah. And and so if the law's not right, that, that just opens up a, a whole no, another other beautiful kind of thing. And that's why, like, you know, there are lots of activists that are working on these things through law but then now you know understandably you know people are getting a little bit annoyed because politicians mm. are kind of like creating these kind of like strange laws i'll call yeah. them strange laws they're, they're creating strange things right strange mm. things that in creating the strange thing it it it's kind it's kind of like they're they're they're, they're like playing in in the nether region between like what has been traditionally accepted as being legislative and legal and so forth right mm. whether you dispute it or not right that's not the that's not the the thing i'm talking about it's not about whether the law was right or just or la da da da, da. it's just laws get passed yeah. rightly or wrongly so we get laws that get passed but there's new types of laws that are being passed that bring in a in between space that that where where it's coming in and 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 they're using then other measures to sort of say like trust us it's okay yeah. we're enacting this law might sound a little bit scary at the moment but trust us it'll be okay um uh and so you know, we're, we're getting laws that are kind of colliding with what people thought were their rights. The thing about um, they... the thing about new laws is I'm, I'm worried that they'll say they'll be, you, you won't be allowed to protest next due to this thing. And then they will, once that law is there, they could slightly change it that you're not allowed to protest because we said so. You know, or we, you know, because of this, you know, you can't protest because there's 50 people in your group or you can't protest because there's 100 people in your group. And, you know, how they can, and this is what worries me when you have different, um, when you allow one government to make new laws, is the question that next government comes in and makes harder laws or changes it. And um, the other thing is, um, getting back to America, one of the things that people are talking about is like, Whenever you have unruliness in the country or in a, um, you know, in a state, people 
will always choose someone with the iron fist to come into governance next. And it's kind of, you know, it's like, oh, you know, there's a lot of unlawfulness happening. So we're going to choose someone who's going to be tough on law. And the worry is that, that you know, whoever they vote in next will start be a strong on man or so on or pertinent lady or whoever. And I think we might see that happening here if we're not careful where the freedoms that we have, you know, uh, when we have so many different changes that people on the average Kiwi is going, um, it wasn't this whole lockdown, you know, wasn't as um, necessary as it was, was it? So what about all these new police laws? Where did these come from? You know, the whole idea of like, um, you know, um, bringing in laws, uh, new police laws and, and what was it like level two? when you could have brought them in level one or was it no level four or something like yeah level four mm. you know to stop people from doing that um you know and um i mean there was a thing i mean we talked about earlier how um in the early broadcast how they were trying to say well people up north weren't allowed to barricade themselves in from tourists or people going through because they wanted to pr protect the communities and they're saying well police should be up there doing something about it. it's like they're trying to protect themselves they have a right to protect their communities, but you're saying they don't? Whose side are you on? It's like the same people like, you know, in the US were saying, blue, be true to the blue, you know, our cops, our cops, our cops, only weeks ago, you know, you know, you gotta trust your cops, you gotta trust your cops, and now they're like, the cops, the cops, the cops. And the same thing, I think, um, like I, I actually uh, have got a quote are... here. I've got a great cool. quote here from um, some people that I that I think, um, hopefully, people listening to this would mm. would know the great prophets that spoke here. Mm. But um, the great prophets said, "Your dad caught you smoking." And he says, no way. Yeah. That hypocrite smokes two packs a day. Man, living at home is such a drag. drag. Now your mum threw away your best comic mag. <laughs> you, you didn't have got to say that. Fight. Thank you. For your right, yeah. Party. And I actually think, ironically, um, I, I I think that we are getting um, the opportunity to vote for the party that is for party, because yeah. because one of the strange things that's happened is that everyone's been very upset about lots of things, hmm. and people have been very empathetic and very giving in fact of you know like we're not able to have parties and then some people have been trying to organize secret parties but everyone goes like no, we shouldn't have a secret party maybe that isn't a good idea but everyone wants to party and 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 i i actually think you know maybe what we should t do is that we we should we should change the whole election coming up just yeah. turn it upside down and go and, and w maybe you and I could do this and maybe we could actually like launch this as like where we interview people from the different political parties. That'd and what awesome. we do and what we do is that what, what we do is that we we, we drill them mm. about how down their party is about partying. Yeah. Because, you know, like if they're not down for partying, I'm not too sure that ethically I could vote for them. Yeah, I need a party that's down for party. Yeah. So um, now they all say they're parties, right? But I th I think we should find the most partyist party. Exactly. And, it's like the National and, Party, the Labour Party. Yeah. But um, I was going. I don't know what a na I don't know um, what a national party looks like, but uh, but, what's but the I've also party? been to well, I've also been to Labour parties, and mm. you just do a lot of work. Um, and I've been to national parties, um, 
they've usually been in capitals. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think we should, I think we should do something around this is to find the best party party. Well, when I was, uh, when I was, when I started, you know, when we were talking about governments and stuff like this, I was thinking like, how would I put together a government, right? You know, you, you kind of go like, who in my, in, the, in my, um, and people I can tell you now how to do it. It's quite yeah. simple. You you have a party. Maybe fight. Maybe do ten parties. Yeah, and then you'll find out who do, who does ten parties really well. I think that's how North Korea runs. <laughs> I think they just have parties all the time. Is that, is that I don't think there's any killing or in, or any poisoning yeah. going on. It's just going like you just need to keep the going one to party parties. Doing everything. Yeah, yeah, you just got to go to the same party all the time. It's like yeah. Roundhog Day, seeing the same old people every time, right? Yeah. Going, oh, kumbaya, God. kumbaya, day in, day out. Yeah, I think and um, yeah. So I, I think we should. It'll have, be interesting, you know, and and maybe, and maybe if we can't be satisfied that there's some legitimate party party out there, then we should just literally have the party party. Yeah, create a new party. Yeah. Now, now, if we've got a new party, 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 then, then, and if we don't get lots of young people joining us, then we need to ask the question: Is that who is the party for the party, 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 party people? I was, I was, um, I was seriously thinking because the election's coming up. I was seriously thinking, you know, um, knowing the that people we that should make food, a joke of it. What's that? Oh no, sorry, that's oh sorry. Oh, no, no, I was seriously thinking who would... We, we shouldn't you know, make a course, joke of the election coming up because that would be terrible. That would be it's very not cool. A joke, it's not a joking matter. Like, seriously, no. like, that, you know, like yeah. potentially, you know, like a million people stand to lose their lives if we make the wrong decision. Exactly. But the other thing about being a being in sort of like in polit being a pol politician is you have to be a good liar... But also think you know everything, and you have the best. You know that you 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 know what's right for everyone. Well, I don't think we That's should. That's the weirdest thing. Well, I don't think we should make fun of people that predict the weather. Um, <laughs> um oh, what do they call them? Oh, um, meteorological meteorologists. Oh, yeah. yes, that's it. Yes. You know, anyway, the weather predictors, you know, yeah. and it's like, you know, it's taken the weather predictors a long time to get their reputation back on track, you know, for a long time there, you know, like they suffered huge reputational damage because they would literally say, hey, today's going to be fine, tomorrow's going to be wet, right? People would believe them and then it's kind of like it didn't happen that way and then, Poor meteor meteorological people, they were just kind of like, like which, which part of the, the tarot reading did we get wrong? <laughs> but anyway, and and then they worked out that it was climate change. So right. then when they actually factored in climate change into their predictions, then they went, oh, we're really screwed now. Like, we're, we're, we're never going to be able to predict the weather ever again and no one is ever going to trust us but anyway i think i think and uh, just to close all of this off i think yeah you know if if we can take faith in the fact that we're the people actually are now trusted members of our community mm. i i think that we should take hope that we should be able to trust a whole bunch of other more challenging things yeah. you know, in what we're living through. And if we can give the, the weather person a break and do go every now and we get it wrong, um, you know, um, let's just uh, stay strong and uh, no one get carried away about, you know, what's happening mm. elsewhere, you know. Let's um, take this time to think about what an amazing country we have and uh, yep. what are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's a good way to close off tonight. What are we going to do next? And um, I think 
I'm I'm excited as much as I'm in, um, you know dismayed by every new rules that are made up. I'm I'm, ex I'm excited because I know that within two three weeks we'll be able to go. Forget levels anymore. You know, let's just just get out there. Let's forget levels anymore. Let's get out there, and um, you know because uh, the, I, the, one of the things um, is that when we get too clean, we're more susceptible to disease. And viruses when we get too clean and um, you know when you stopped eating mud when we were kids and parents kept us away from it then we started having allergies to other things I Gary I, I think don't quote me on it but that's my thinking there that like when I was you know when I was eating worms and stuff I was fine and the next generation came along and they didn't eat, do that and now like you have a peanut allergy we never had peanut allergies in my generation that kind of thing you know oh you have this allergy or that allergy Oh, we didn't know it was there because we're in, we didn't know it was what it is for because now we're able to you know understand it a bit further because of science and this this is things um that's really cool about where we live now is that we're able to find out so much more about us that we've been able to find out in the last 50 years and um and it's great and but we're still on a ideological on a on a uh, Ethnic political things we still kept held back from moving forward, and this one, like, I mean, I always go, well, how long before it's enough? You know, before enough is enough, and we can just go, you know, let's move on together as one, and do a great thing for each other, and build a stronger community. Because the more divided we are, the worse we are, and the weaker we are as a people. And I think this, this, our strength comes in our, from basically like a, like a rope, right? One rope on its own, easy to break. When you have three wrapped right around each other, the old adage or whatever they call it, you know, there's strength in numbers. And if we're divided, you know, we become very weak. And I think a lot of times people want to divide us uh, through different things, uh, you know, very, very different things. Politics, religion, ideas, um, you know, personal qualms, personal um, systems of being raised, um, how we uh, how we think, what books we read, you know, who's our best author, anything as simple as that. What's our favorite music, you know? Who's our favorite rock singer or hip, -stop, uh, hip, hip hop artist and so on. But at the end of the day, we just, like I say, um, I think, uh, um, you know, um, someone once said, when you cut us, we bleed. All of us bleed the same. Um, you know, under the, under the very, very thin skin, we're all the same. And I think um, when, we, when we forget that, we end up causing so much destruction, to, especially to each other, but more than, more than that, to ourselves. I think... Um, that's where I think personal responsibility comes in when we go, you know, I don't think I want to cause myself too much, too much pain. Once we, once we start thinking that way, then we go, well, then my brother, I don't want to cause you that much pain either. And I think that's what it comes down to. Um, when we, when we really think about how we want to proceed and we were talking about how do we value each other? And it's when it comes down to, it's like, we all bleed if we're cut. And um, our strength is in our numbers, our strength is in our communities, and in our communities where so many different people made up, but we all deep down need the four things that um, Jared talked about last week, air, water, food, shelter. And I think um, that's me, but I'll let you have the last words, um, Jared, Captain, and we'll close off for tonight. Thank you so much. It's so awesome always to talk to you. And um, I've got a fifth one to now add, which is that we all dream. I thought you were going to say community. We all dream. We all dream. Yeah. Sixth one would be we all need each other community i think the no man is an island thing um but you're right we all dream and we all dream for a better day a better tomorrow 
and mm -hmm. that's it guys thank you for watching us uh thank you for watching the session and um thank you for hanging out with us and we sometimes we delve into heavy stuff but we try to keep it light but sometimes you it gets heavy and but um you know, you're discussing politics, you're discussing all this other stuff, but thank you for joining us from both myself and the cap. Takite Ano, wherever you are, stay safe, look after yourselves, and we'll catch you next time.